I would like all of us to please stand, place your hand over your heart, and recite with me the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, I think those words don't get said often enough, uh, especially in our schools anymore. So before I get into the actual uh, subject matter that we're going to discuss today, I'm going to maybe give a little, little bit of a civics lesson in that I want to discuss a couple things. I promise to get through it pretty fast, but I think they're important points for all of us. Um, on government, what is the primary goal of all governments? Maybe. The primary goal of every government on earth, period, is to stay in power. It's the first thing a government has to do. It's got to guarantee that it can stay in power. Otherwise, it can't do any of the things, good, bad, or indifferent, that it's set up or designed to do. There was a very famous Greek scholar named Thucydides who was the actual historian for the Peloponnesian War uh, back when all the Greek, Greeks were fighting each other. He's very, very famous and he came up with a set of laws. And these laws have remained unchanged since the time man has actually walked on this earth, but Thucydides was the first one to actually put them down in writing, so to speak, the laws of power. Power always seeks to dominate the weak, always. Power will always seek to increase its strength. Grows and grows, gets stronger, gets stronger. Power will never give up its position willfully. Never happen. Power will only yield to a superior power. So bear that in mind because that doesn't just apply to a government or a society, but it also applies to the individuals. Okay, And that's going to tie in a little bit when we get going. So our government is it a democracy? Well, the answer to that is no, it's not. Our government is a republic, just as it said in the Pledge of Allegiance, and to the republic for which it stands. It's a republic. Well, what's a republic? Well, it's a representative democracy. And what is a representative democracy? According to Merriam-Webster, a republic is a government in which the supreme power of the people is vested in, the supreme power is vested in the people through their elected representatives. The supreme power is vested in the people. It's invested in us, every single person in here. We are the supreme power of the government. Fortunately, somewhere along the line, some of the politicians have forgotten that fact. Our Constitution is set up to prevent the laws of power, as Thucydides put down 2,000 plus years ago, from becoming the law of the land. That's why we have a transitional government. Every four years, it's supposed to change. I just wish it would change for the better. Sometimes it changes for the worse. That's enough on government. So everybody knows it's not a democracy, it's a representative democracy called a republic. So our votes do count. And the people that we put in power do count. So we have to exercise that because that is a right given to us by the founding fathers who I believe were probably the, one of the greatest brain trusts that ever existed in the history of mankind. This is my chance to brag a little bit. This book just came out uh, about a month ago, and it's called The Great Patriot Boycott. It's by a, a couple of authors that I happen to know and then forwarded by my friend, Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman. And in that book, Emerson Knives is named 
the, t the 18th out of 100 best conservative com companies to do business with in the United States. And right now it's a bestseller uh, on Amazon and everything. And I'm very proud to say that about two weeks ago, Donald Trump did a full endorsement of that book uh, with about a two paragraph uh, Twitter thing that he put out. So I'm real proud of it. This is my chance to brag a little bit. We've worked real hard to be who we are and uh, we're never gonna change. But that's that on civics and that's it on my bragging. This is the book that I wanted to have done by the time I got here to the show. Unfortunately, we're still in the final edit of it, but that's the subject of this uh, lecture, Knowledge Destroys Fear. And it will be coming out in maybe the next month or so. So if you're interested, just uh, check our website for it. So what is fear? Most people have a, have a pretty strong misinterpretation of just what fear is. And we're going to talk about that because because of that misinterpretation we have a tendency to give fear a power or control over what we do. And that's especially true when you're in a high stress environment involving danger. Fear is Nothing more than the emotional interpretation we assign to a stimulus or an anticipated event. I got to go in and ask my boss for a raise. Whew. I'm a little bit nervous about that, etc. I've assigned an emotional response to that. Why should I assign an emotional response to go and talk to another person, even if, if it's my boss and I'm getting to ask him for a raise? Okay? It's because that fear, for that moment in time, because we gave it an emotional status, is starting to trigger those emotional things in our mind. And it's also an emotional response when something goes boom, whether it's a gunshot, a bomb, or somebody just comes out around the corner and startles you. It all starts with the human nervous system. So. In a brief way, what I'm going to do is just describe what that is, because it, it's, there's a couple chapters in the book that are actually dedicated to the, the uh, explanation of the human nervous system and how it works. Basically, any stimulus, anything that you see, and a stimulus can be me uh, touching this thing right here, it can be me taking a step, it can be a, a loud noise or whatever. We're always being stimulated through our eyes, our ears, our nose, and taste and, and, and sense of touch. But what, for the purpose of what we're discussing today, we're talking about what happens in the amygdala. And that is the, the human being's first line of defense, if you will. It's the thing that actually triggers all the cascading effects that we're going to talk about. Boom. Loud noise something goes boo in the night, whatever. Stimulus in equals reaction out, okay? We're going to discuss how we're able to take control of what that reaction out is, because most of the time we can't control the stimulus, because that's what's going on around us in our environment. Anytime there's a spontaneous stimuli, what happens is there's a physical response, there's a psychological response, and there's an emotional response. We do not have control, and we do have control of those things. That's kind of a dichotomy that I've just discussed here, but you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. The thing is, what's going to happen is going to happen, but it's what we do with what happens that determines how we, how we deal with that stimulus. Boo! That's the stimulus. When the amygdala kicks in, it triggers one thing. The amygdala does not see, oh, that's just a pillow flying at me through the air. I'm okay. No. If a pillow was flying through me at, in, in the air, even though that's a soft landing, I'm not going to get hurt by it. When the amygdala is triggered by that, it sees threat. 
It sees danger. That's its default every single time. It will never do anything but default to threat. The reason? Because that's our first line of defense, okay? That's what keeps us alive. That's what kept the, us being aware that that saber-toothed tiger just leaped through the air or someone threw a, a rock at us or whatever it was way, way back. It's part of our ability to protect ourselves. So that startle response is triggered, okay? And I can get into the startle response if anybody wants to talk about that a little bit later. But essentially what it is, is it's this move right here. Your legs flex a little bit, stomach tightens up, shoulders hunch up. The, uh, the hands generally come up to about eye level, but they're, they're designed to protect this area because what is the most vulnerable area on a human being? The neck, okay? That's the, why does a predator like a, like a saber-toothed tiger or a cheetah or anything, what, what do they attack? They may wound an animal to, to, to slow it down, but what do they attack? They attack the neck. They're either going to obstruct, obstruct the airways or, or uh, cause a break in the circulatory system. Same thing with a human being. We have a neck just like a gazelle does. This is the, the easiest way for a human being to die outside of something like a gunshot or a, or a, I mean, you can die from a whole bunch of different things, but this is the most vulnerable thing right here. So our, our bodies are designed to protect that because I guess maybe when we were being stalked by a cheetah or whatever, that's where they would attack us also. And if you look at coyote attacks and mountain lion attacks and all that uh, currently, those are the same targets that they're after. So you've got all of those things going on in the in the startle response. At the same time, you've got this whole um, physiological response, which involves uh, the adrenal uh, glands dumping adrenaline into your body. And I'll go into the details on that in a minute, because it's a long list of things. Well, let's go back to the OODA loop. The other thing that's, that's also uh, triggered is the OODA loop. And uh, how many people in here have, have knowledge of or have heard of the OODA loop at this point. Okay, good, good. Because the OODA loop is something that happens to every single person. And the way that I describe it to uh, individuals that might not uh, have it, knowledge of it or have heard of it before, uh, I walk into a room, it's a dark room, and a TV, TV screen comes on. At that moment, I don't know what that is. There's a, there's a tiny millisecond of a fraction of time where I don't know what that is. Oh, it's a TV set, okay? So I've observed it, I saw it. The next thing that happened was, oh, it is a TV set. Boom, that's the second step. The next step is, what do I do? Oh, okay, that's an old Seinfeld episode that I'm looking at on TV. Okay, so now I've oriented myself, I've observed it, it came on, it triggered those first three. Oh wow, I saw that episode already. So I've decided what it is, now I've decided what I'm gonna do, and the last thing is, I'm gonna change channels. So that's my action, okay? Well, it's the same principle in combat, <clears throat> or any unexpected spontaneous stimulus, you're gonna go through that OODA loop. Now, the thing about the OODA loop, and why it's important is because for a person who might sit at a desk all day and has never engaged in, let's say, physical activity like sports or they've, they've never gone through any kind of uh, martial training or they've never been a soldier or a police officer or an EMT or something like that, uh, their OODA loop is a little bit slower. So the people that are engaged in a high-stress environment, because they are what you would call stress inoculated, if you will, their OODA loop goes a lot faster. So the faster you can make this OODA loop happen, the better you are against, actually, against a physical opponent, the faster I can make that happen. I stay outside of his OODA loop, and I'm in control of the situation, and I make him keep engaging his OODA loop. And I'll get, I'll get to that in a minute, too, because I want myself to be in control of that and only go through it once, but I want my opponent to go through it again and again and again and again and again. And if you think about it, I'll tell you briefly, there was a uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Robert Boyd came up with the idea of the OODA loop, and he uh, became the originator of the Top Gun Navy fighting schools and a whole bunch of stuff like that. He went back through um, all of the data for aerial combat, airplane to airplane, 
since uh, they were first used in World War I. And what he determined was that every pilot engaged in combat, the most likely time for him to be shot down was his very first mission. Highest probab probability of en when engaging combat that they would be shot down is on the very first mission. But he also saw, according to the data, that after a pilot had gone through 12 combat sorties, they never got shot down. Very highly unlikely that after 12 combat engagements would that pilot ever be shot down. He could go the rest of the war, he could fight 200 missions, wouldn't be shot down. So he looked at that and said, okay, what, what's going on here? Came up with the idea of the OODA loop, which is something that he just assigned to that, that cycle that we go through. And he figured out that if these pilots could go through this cycle again and again and again and again, like I said, speeding up that OODA loop, why don't we put them through those first 12 combat missions in training? So that when they take off the deck of a carrier, they're going to survive. Well, when they started instituting his ideas into that, our survival rate and our pilot uh, capabilities skyrocketed. And we had the best, and we still do have the best uh, fighter pilots in, in the world, bar none. So by recognizing it, you can break it down and start to modify it. Now the other thing that gets engaged when you're struck with that spontaneous stimuli is the fight or flight mechanism. But that's what most people think it is, fight or flight. Well, it isn't just fight or flight. Fight or flight is in there, fight, flight, but there is also posture, submit, and freeze. Now we can all be subject to any one of those five. It just depends on a couple things depends on what that stimulus is, depends on what environment we're in, and it also depends on your life experience, okay? Your reaction is determined by your interpretation of events, okay? Now, again, OODA loop, startle reflex, all of those good things, the faster that you can get through all of that stuff, the faster you're going to be able to figure out what it really is that's happening. Because again, that amygdala defaults to threat. So it's fight or flight, boom. Go through all of those things, and if it's a real threat, one of those five events is going to take place. But if it's not, you're going to have to figure out what is actually going on. Now, that is a reflection of our bias for normalcy. Every time we are experiencing a stimulus or something, especially for the first time, or an unexpected thing like an explosion or a gunshot or uh, a car veering into your um, uh, lane, we have what is called a bias for normalcy. We want to interpret things as normal. Our brain works really hard, and, there, and there's a difference, I shouldn't use the term brain, our mind works really hard to assign th an interpretation of things that fit our normal view of the world, okay? That's why it's so hard sometimes to anticipate what the enemy's uh, next acts are gonna be, because we're trying to fit it into our interpretation of normal. Now, think about this. And I can cite you a whole bunch of examples of it that are they're so startling, you're like, I can't believe that would never happen to me. Yeah, it would happen to you, no matter what. The bias for normalcy exists. For example, you're in a mall. Pop, pop, pop. What happened? You had talked to the soccer mom. She heard balloons going off. Talked to another guy. He heard maybe a car backfire. Talked to a U.S. Marine just back from Afghanistan. Guess what he heard? He heard gunshots, and he was probably correct, because I don't think there's a lot of car backfires in the mall, and I don't think a lot of balloons go popping in the mall. So again, they all hear the same exact thing, but 
It isn't normal for somebody to fire off a gun in a mall, thank God, yet, although it seems to be becoming more and more normal as we go. The housewife or the soccer mom interpreted it as balloons, but it's a gunshot. Well, maybe she never heard a gunshot. Well, maybe she didn't, but still, she fit that noise into something she could see as normal, balloons. The Marine, on the other hand, he knows exactly what it is because he's heard it before. His interpretation for normal is a little bit different because of the environment and the situations that he's experienced. But that bias for normalcy, if we do misinterpret what's going on because we're trying to fit crazy into a non-crazy environment or a non-crazy situation, can freeze the bias for action. Now, when I talked about fight or flight and all those other things, that's part of the action. That OODA loop was getting you ready for the action. That was that last thing, A, in OODA, act, okay? That's what was coming up next. But if we have a tough time getting to this point right here, bias for action, in, a, in an armed environment, in a dangerous environment, when things are happening in milliseconds, that millisecond can mean the difference between life or death, or life or death, or or how many people are injured or killed in an in a active shooter environment. That bias for action is also one of our greatest survival mechanisms because the faster you can act, the faster you can get off the X, the faster you can take cover, the faster that you can grab those kids and get them out of the line of fire, your chances for survival and the chances for not being a victim go up. The longer it takes you to get to this movement, bias for action, the chances go down of you coming out unscathed, okay? Bias for action means you're ready to go as quickly as you possibly can. Now, how do I get through that? Part of it is by starting to recognize all these things that we interpreted as fear, so to speak, an emotional response, and start to see things as they really are. So, that bias for action, when we finally get to the point where we're getting off the X, so to speak, leads to the protocols of action. And I know this sounds like a whole bunch of technical words and all that, but it's really what we use to describe all of these, these things. The protocols of action are detect, evade, barricade, and engage. And they are in that order. Because what is the safest thing to do of all things? It's to detect the danger before it happens. It's to detect the threat before it happens. Okay? Who is the greatest fighter of all times? The one who never ever, ever has to get into a fight. And I'm not talking about scuffles, and I'm not talking about defending your girlfriend's honor because some guy smacked her on the rear end as she walked by. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about life or death, uh, active threats that would either kill, harm, or maim you or innocence around you. So detect also means figure out what the hell's going on. And that whole sequence of things, those balloons that were popping, you can't get to this until you recognize what you're looking for, okay? Now, I don't expect every single person in here to be in what we call condition orange all the time, where you're constantly looking around and trying to figure things out. But I'll tell you what, if you've ever dealt with any of these uh, Israelis or if you know anybody who's in the uh, IDF, the Israelis are like that. They're almost in condition orange all the time. If you're ever in a car with any of them, their heads are like this all the time. And it's just a matter, that's the environment they came out of. Because, for example, I guess uh, a couple weeks back, I think 1,400 missiles, 1,400 were dropped into to, uh, Israeli territory. They live in a constant state. Uh, one of my friends was telling me it's, uh, gosh, what, I'll think of it in a moment, but it's, it's, a, it's an anachronism that just doesn't make sense. It's... Uh, I'll, I'll think of it in a minute when I, when I think of it. But 
Anyway, with your radar system up, your first and best defense is to detect danger. In other words, if, I, if it's 1 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and I want to stop for a drink someplace, I'm not going into the biker bar with 22 Harleys parked out front. It's just common sense. Way more likely to have something happen there than if I go over to Sal's Irish pub down the, down the street. So you want to be able to detect both pre, pre, preemptively and, for example, again, referencing the Israelis, you get on a bus and a guy's sitting over there and he's got a backpack on and he sets it down and it goes clunk real heavy and then he starts to get up to move away from the backpack there could be a bomb in there so I'm gonna I'm gonna be on that no matter what okay that's my part of the detection and we'll get to, to something else that's important in that also the next thing is evade now what does evade mean that means get out of dodge okay uh, what is the second best defensive mechanism that we have our ability to run. So if you were really concerned about protecting yourself, no matter what your level of training is, you should also practice running. Practice those 100 yard sprints, okay? Or at least 50 or 60 yard sprints because that running has saved, saved more human beings throughout history than almost probably any defensive mechanism that exists. So, evade, you wanna get out of there. If you're in an environment, for example, uh, a school, or a building, an office building. Someone comes through the door, bang, 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 he's shooting people, whatever. Your best chance of survival is to remove yourself from that environment. What's the best time, let's say for example, um, what's the best time to really run out of a situation? The best time is when it starts. A guy goes into a bank, boom, everybody down, this is a robbery. Your best chance of escape at that moment, to use this as an analogy, is to get out that door when he is not in control of the situation. Because what he's going to do from that point forward is he's going to wrest control of that situation. Everybody into the corner. Everybody on the ground. As that sequence of events takes place, your likelihood or chance of escape is sliding downhill real, real fast. So in the first moments of confusion are always the best time to escape a dangerous environment. Barricade. Can't escape. I didn't detect it. The guy came through the door just now. We couldn't get out of here. Evade. I can't escape. What's next? Barricade. Put something between you and the danger. Okay? If I was here and someone came in right now, I'd hit the deck behind these chairs. What good is that going to do? Well, it's better than standing here like this and looking at him. For schools and things like that, we always teach, pile every single thing you can against that door. Every single thing in the room that you can. If there's something going on uh, in, a, in a classroom or on the campus that's a little ways away and we don't have the chance to get out, we're going to barricade that door with every single thing that we've got. Okay? Now, does everybody know the difference between cover and concealment? Okay, concealment is hiding behind a bush. Cover is hiding behind a brick wall. They both hide you, but one won't physically prevent contact with the enemy. The brick wall is always a better choice. So if you're in an environment like that, one of the best safe rooms in any environment is generally a restroom. Now, you're, you're saying, okay, that doesn't make sense because you've put yourself in, an, in a room that only has one escape route, one, that door that you just came through. Well, I'm not talking. We've already gone past detect. We've already gone past evade. I can't escape. So I'm going to retreat to that bathroom because generally they have thick metal doors. They're covered with tile, so there's cement and a whole bunch of stuff, rebar and everything maybe in the walls. Uh, I'm going to hunker down in there, okay? Engage. Didn't detect it, couldn't get away from it, couldn't hide from it or conceal myself, couldn't find cover. I need to engage the enemy. That's the only other and last way to stop the threat. Be 
talking about that OODA loop, okay, when an active shooter comes into an environment and he can shoot, you are caught in the OODA loop and you can't get out of it. Because if I'm spraying rounds, you're reacting and you're constantly reacting, constantly reacting, constantly reacting. Well, guess what I'm doing? I'm acting. Well, how do I stop that from taking place and put the bad guy into the OODA loop? You, by engagement. And that could be anything from throwing a, a, a book at him, uh, tossing chairs at him, or physically attacking him. So many times we've heard the football coach rushes in and tackles the guy. Football coach got shot and died. But what happens when that bad guy has to take return fire. And that doesn't necessarily mean bullets. That means now he's being attacked. Guess what he does? He stops shooting. Because it's much easier for me to go boom, 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 than boom, boom, boom. That's the difference. Okay? When you can engage his OODA loop, and make him react to you and not you react to him, the shooting stops. Or at least it becomes way less infect effective. Now, the other thing too, if we go past that a little bit, what does it take to stop a guy with a gun? Yeah. It takes a gun. What happens every time the police arrive when the cavalry gets there? The shooting stops. Generally, the guy stops himself. Why do you do that? I don't know, because he's crazy. Well, that doesn't make sense. Guess what I'm trying to do right now? I'm trying to make him normal. My bias for normalcy is going, well, how could a human being do that? He's a crazy guy. Can't understand it. If I was crazy, I might understand it, because that's now my, our normal, his and mine. But it applies in all of these different levels of human interaction. So engagement, whether it's just, I mean, whether it's shouting at the guy, throwing things at him, running at him, tackling him, shooting him back, whatever, it doesn't matter. If, I, if he's going to ha have to react to me, the shooting stops. And a lot of those guys are not trained uh, shooters, although you can get pretty good playing video games these days. I've seen that for sure. But, well, that's interesting too. Let me talk about that for a moment. Uh, it is natural as a human being who's come from what we call a good environment, good upbringing, Christian, uh, Western way of looking at things. It's not in our nature to do physical harm to other people. We're, we're good people. We don't actively go out there and slap somebody in the face as we walk by. It's just not the way we are. Bad guys do stuff like that. So, why can these kids go into an environment, why can a 14-year-old go into an environment and start shooting other students in a school, kids that he knew and grew up with or whatever? Now, there's always bullying almost every single time, so that's a little bit of a factor. But how can they do that? How can they act smooth, as silk in an environment that's literally chaos and people are dying and screaming and there's guns going off because it isn't so much about going to the range and practicing but it's inoculating themselves to that environment on a video game because they are engaged in that game and when they shoot that imaginary gun and the guy's head explodes they've seen it happen a thousand times before and I've always lectured to police officers, you have to understand something. You get called into an environment where you have to uh, unholster your, your, your sidearm once in a great while. Think about the bad guy that you're, that you're having to do that, who's caused you to do that. He's probably done that a hundred times. He walks into a place with a gun out like this and says, give me all your god dang money. He's done that again and again and again and again. 
you are actually at a disadvantage psychologically to that bad guy. And unless you recognize that, there's a higher chance that you're going to get caught a, just a split second behind the fact. Now, I hope I can pull this off because I haven't done this before. But this is so important that I added it into this. It's very helpful for people to hear that they should make themselves competent and dangerous and take the proper place in the world. Competent and dangerous? Mm -hmm. Why dangerous? Because it's the alternative to being weak. And weak is not good. The people who shoot up the high schools, they're weak. They're weak. How is it good to be dangerous? Because it makes you formidable. And life is a very difficult process. And it's not for, you're not prepared for it unless, unless you have the capacity for, to be dangerous. That doesn't mean that you should be cruel. It doesn't mean any of that. There's a statement in the New Testament, the meek shall inherit the earth. But the meek isn't well translated. It means something more like those who, those who have swords and know how to use them but keep them sheathed will inherit the world. That's a way better way of thinking about it. You have to be powerful and formidable and then peaceful in that order. And that's not the same as being naive and weak and harmless, which is what young men are being encouraged to be. It's like, that's a very bad idea. It's a very bad idea. Because naive, weak, and harmless means that you can't withstand the tragedies of life. You can't bear any responsibility. You'll end up bitter. And when you get bitter, then you get dangerous. But one thing I'm not getting, there's a big difference between letting people do something for themselves and saying men should be dangerous. By dangerous, that implies I should be ready to threaten someone, to hurt somebody. No, you should be capable of it. But that doesn't mean you should use it. There's nothing to you otherwise. Like, if you're not a formidable force, there's, not, there's no morality in your self-control. If you're incapable of violence, not being violent isn't a virtue. People who teach martial arts know this full well, right? If you learn a martial art, you learn to be dangerous, but simultaneously you learn to control it. Both of those come together. And the combination of that capacity for danger and the capacity for control is what brings about the virtue. Otherwise, you confuse weakness with, with moral virtue. I'm harmless, therefore I'm good. It's like, no, that isn't how it works. That isn't how it works at all. If you're harmless, you're just weak. And if you're weak, you're not going to be good. You can't be, because it takes strength to be good. It's very difficult to be good. One of my heroes. <laughs> yeah. Jordan Peterson, if you ever get a chance to attend a lecture or read one of his books or watch any of his videos, he prob probably has the highest degree of moral clarity about how, how we should be as people or a human being of anyone I've ever, ever experienced. Jordan Peterson. So, what can you do to work through all of those things that we just kind of discussed briefly? Well, the first thing you have to understand is what we call situational awareness, okay? Now, what is situational awareness? Situational awareness is your ability and your conscious effort to be aware of your environment and everything in your environment, at least to the degree that you can. Now, that's going to change if I'm on patrol in the streets of Iraq versus I'm sitting in a movie theater versus I'm sitting in a restaurant versus I'm, sitting, I'm driving in my car. Now, what situational awareness is, is being 100% aware and also in control of your environment with you at the center and it's extending out about 25 to 30 feet because any person or individual that's within that circle or enters into that circle can literally reach out and touch you in a blink of an eye. So situational awareness is something that you may say, well, isn't that being a little paranoid? And you know, you're, you're always thinking people are going to go out to get you or whatever. No, think about this. I guarantee that every single person who has a driver's license is an active participant in situational awareness. Why do I say that? Because think about what you do when you're driving a car. 
You are in control of the vehicle. You're in control of the speed. You're keeping it on the straight and narrow, whatever that is. You're, you're staying under the speed limit. You're looking for people that might be crossing the street. You see a ball roll out on the street. You anticipate that there's a child or somebody coming behind it. You see a dog get get off a leash and dart out. You're, you're watching what's going on. Not only that, you're anticipating what's going on with other drivers. Is that guy weaving? Is that guy speeding up? Is his brake lights going on? You're engaged in active situational awareness. You may not be aware of it because no one ever told you that term before, but that's the same exact way that you have to be all the time. Now, I'm assuming one thing, because that, that's part of, and what Jordan was talking about in, in, in my estimation, is almost the perfect definition of a warrior, okay? To have the ability to be dangerous, but to possess the ability to control it. Because if I didn't have the ability to control it, guess what I am? I'm a bad guy, okay? Because one of the other things that happens with bad guys is they have a very, very, it's, it's funny because uh, what they found in a lot of what you would call psychopathic, sociopathic uh, personality disorders in violent criminals is they have an under, underdeveloped frontal uh, cerebral cortex here. And that's part of your emotional control. That's where that takes place in the brain. Impulse control. Okay? Everybody has weird thoughts all the time. That guy cutting in front of me, you know. But we control it. Bad guys, they don't have any impulse control. Somebody cuts in front of, in front of them, blam! And all of a sudden it's like, holy smokes, that guy rammed in the back of my car. He's screaming at me, telling me to pull over, blah, blah, blah. That's lack of control. When I walk into a restaurant, or one of the other things, and again, people think, okay, you're, now you're, you are being a little paranoid. No, I'm not. When I walk into a room, generally, I make a, a brief millisecond of eye contact with every individual that I'm able to see. Okay? Now, there's something else that's important to think about. What is the greatest fear of a predator? Fear of discovery. Okay? If you think about it, uh, for example, uh, and most predators are ambush predators, all the way from the praying mantis up to the bad guy hiding in the bushes who's going to grab a gal uh, who's walking out to her car uh, in the parking lot. Concealment, stealth, surprise attack. Those are the three elements that give them their best chance of success. The number one thing that thwarts that or takes you off their radar screen is the fact I see you. That's it. So let's take a little example of that. Uh, in India, tigers attack and kill people. They attack from behind. Why do they attack from behind? Because you don't have eyes in the back of your head. So some real innovative Indian guy said, you know what? What if I painted eyeballs on the back of my hat? Boom. Tiger attacks go way down because the tiger's going, damn, he's looking right at me. Okay, next. Oh, he's looking at me too. Next. Oh, he don't have a hat on. That's my victim. It's that same principle. They don't want to be discovered. So when we, looked, when we talked about detect, here's, here's what happens. We're in a crowd here. There's a bad guy, one single bad guy in here. I'm looking around and looking at people, looking them in the eye, just briefly, not staring them down, not challenge staring them or anything like that. And everybody's, that's just a normal behavior. Doesn't, it doesn't trigger anything in you at all. But guess what happens to that bad guy who's sitting in the room? The minute my eyes touch his eyes, Inside his head, the klaxons are going off. Warning, warning, warning. He knows I'm a pedophile guy. He knows I'm a fucking, uh, excuse me. <laughs> he knows I'm a, 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 a psychopath. He knows I'm a whatever. That's what's going on inside his head. Just by that simple fact alone. Brief eye contact. 
And the thing about bad guys is the ones that pick out victims in a crowd, they can do it in a freaking heartbeat. They can scan, which is what they call that, a crowd and pick out victims almost instantaneously. Why? Because they've been doing it their entire life. Those were the bullies that picked out the little guys and little girls on the, on the, uh, on the playground. They f saw the weakness. Oh, wait a minute. Power always attacks weakness. Huh. That's one of those laws. The bully doesn't attack the, the kid who's eight inches taller than him and 30 pounds heavier. Power always attacks the weak. Same exact principle. When I said it, it applies man to man, country to country, society to society, government to government. Situational awareness. Awareness also involves knowledge of the environment. Where are you? Generally, we used to be able to say, hey, if I'm in church, that's a pretty, that's a pretty safe place. I don't have to have all my radar turned on while I'm at Sunday service. That's changed, too, a little bit. But I'm going to use it as an example. Or let's just use a, a family dinner at home. Pretty safe environment. You don't have to be all spun up while you're sitting around with the, with the cousins over or the aunts and uncles, because you're all family, and nobody's going to generally ever do anything wrong. So my knowledge of the environment, as opposed to pulling up to that biker bar at 1 o'clock on Saturday night, let's say I have to go in there and pick up my cousin because he called me and said, hey, man, you got to come and get me. i got to know what environment I'm going into, and i got to analyze what are my likelihoods of threats that I might encounter in any kind of environment. If I'm tasked with a unit and we're going down the, the a street in uh, Iraq, I got to know my environment. Now that's institutional knowledge in, in the military that's passed down uh, to all the units that are deployed as they come into theater and all that. So again, but it's part of that educational process and it's part of the training that, that they put all the, uh, all the troops through even before they, they go on deployment. Knowledge of the enemy. Who's my enemy? Okay. What is a likelihood of the different acts that each enemy is going to commit? Let's use the biker bar for a second. Go into a biker bar, I bump into a guy, and that's, sometimes that's all it takes for some people to get triggered. What am I going to face then? I'm not going to face that guy. That ain't going to happen. He may turn around. But guess what's going to happen? When the you-know-what hits the fan, it ain't going to be me and that biker. It's going to be me and six bikers or ten bikers. So my knowledge of the enemy, I bump into the guy, and I don't know anything about the, the culture of the outlaw motorcycle uh, gangs. I don't know anything about it. I bump into the guy. He turns around. He goes, what the F is that all about? Blah, 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 or whatever. And I'm, I'm not a big guy, but I'm six foot two, and this guy's five foot seven. Hey, screw you. What are you going to do about it? Well, guess what? If I didn't know that that guy is a member of a brotherhood that is welded together and joined at the hip, one for all, all for one, I might do that. Because I don't know how it is in an outlaw motorcycle group. So I, I posture, oh wait, that was one of those fight or flight mechanism types. I'm posturing. F you, blah, 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 I'm now a peacock and my feathers are all out. He's doing the same thing, but I don't understand something. I don't know that enemy. Because now I'm not really going to be facing the guy that I thought I could take. I'm going to be facing some guys that are six foot seven and 275 pounds, and they've been up for three days on meth, and they've been drinking for 72 hours, and they're going to rip me to shreds because they will not attack singly. Just using that as an analogy, I actually know a lot of motorcycle guys, so <laughs> don't take any offense. Knowledge of yourself. Who the heck am I? Okay? Who am I? What is my level of training? What is my level of capabilities? Okay? If I had a fist fight when I was a junior in high school and I walk into an environment 
where for whatever reason, either I'm singled out or I caused, a, triggered an event to happen and it's going to lead to a tussle. Do I really want to get into a tussle if the last time that I had any kind of physical altercation was maybe, I'm going on my 50th class reunion this year. The last time I had a fight was 50 years ago? Think about it. And people, people delude themselves. I was a tough guy when I was 18 years old. My God, I still am, blah, blah, blah. I got it. Attitude, rage and fury have won more fights probably than any other skill that exists. But I always tell people, look, let me ask you a question. Did you play sports in high school? Yeah, I was a basketball player. Okay, so now you're 47 years old. Let's take you right now and put you on the basketball court with a bunch of high school basketball players. How are you going to do? You may still have the form, but you're going to be left in the dust. So you can't look at yourself and in the mirror and say, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, unless you really can. Now, I'm not discouraging anyone at all from defending themselves if warranted, because you have to. Oh, wait. That goes all the way back to engage. If I have to fight, I have to fight, no matter what the level of my skill is. If someone grabs that little boy or that little girl, and I'm a mom or dad or a bystander, I have to fight. I, I don't have a choice now. And a police officer going into a, an environment, he can't turn around and go, I, I don't want to do this today. He's got to stay there. He's got to resolve the issue. And if that escalation of force gets to the point where he's got to draw his service revolver and shoot someone, he's got to be prepared to do that. You have to have an honest appraisal and objective view of who you are and what your capabilities are. Habits. Good old Aristotle. Then those Greeks were, Greeks were smart, man, I'm telling you. So much of their stuff is so good. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is then not an act, but a habit. Okay? Now, what's a habit? It's something that we repeatedly do. Well, when it comes to training, you are developing habits, okay? You can develop mental habits and physical habits. And, and beware of one thing, too. A habit doesn't care if it's a good habit or a bad habit. So when you decide to figure out how you're going to prepare yourself for a dangerous or life-threatening environment, practice good habits. Now, how do you do that? Well, you learn from guys that have already done those kind of things. You can research stuff online. You can use common sense. Uh, for example, right now, uh, I used to do, a, I still do a lot of physical training, martial arts type stuff. Well, I've just had uh, my second hip transplant. So I think, objectively, looking at myself in the mirror, my kicking ability has probably been degraded a bit. So I'm not going to say to myself, hey, I can still kick like a mule, because I probably can't. So I would look at my training and modify it to say, okay, where do, I gotta, where do I now have to concentrate to bolster my defense, my strengths, create those habits, okay? So you have to be able to be objective. Surviving a deadly encounter is contingent upon making the correct choices. You can't do that if you don't know what to do. Which is part of what I'm trying to do today. And, and honest, if it sounds like I'm selling the book, I am. Because there's so much good information in this new book that I would hope everybody buys it because that's part of that educational process. Because it isn't all about physical. It isn't all about going to the range. It isn't all about going to the gym. It's also about your, what you're training up here. And that is as important, if not more important, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that in just a second. So when I said, who is the best fighter in the world, the guy that never had to get into a fight, that's what I call preemptive self-defense. Now. The CIA has a maxim, it's called detect, deny, and destroy. That's what they use to protect 
the national security interests of the United States of America. If it's good enough for the CIA, it's good enough for me. Detect, figure out what's going on. Active threats are in the chatter that we're picking up. We deny that. We go take out the bad guys, the bad actors, or we destroy them in their prep time and or maybe actually in the commission of their act. Detect, deny, destroy. Now, what does that mean? Armed but not dangerous. I carry a gun. I carry it all the time. I'm armed. What happens if I don't have my gun? Man, I'm screwed. Because that gun made me dangerous. Did it? What's the gun? It's a hammer. It's a screwdriver. It's a tool. That's all it is. The gun, gun don't care. It's not bad, good, anything else. Just a tool. The gun, the weapon, the knife, the stick, whatever, that doesn't mean I'm dangerous. That does not make me dangerous. My ability to use it might enhance my ability to have superior firepower over an opponent, or at least equal firepower to an opponent, but that's all it is. It's a tool. It's a resource. Now, in the military, we call that weapons dependency. My gun jammed. I'm screwed. No, still got a two or three pound piece of steel in your hand. And in a close CQB encounter, I'm not throwing that gun down because now it's my, that's a, that's a loaded fist right there. It may not be loaded with bullets, but it's going to be loaded with a hell of a smash if I have to hit somebody in the face with it. So, unfortunately, we, a lot of institutions do not understand that concept. And I have seen guys in uh, training where we've been doing uh, uh, simunitions training three or four feet in front of a bad guy, an actor, when the gun malfunctions and them sitting there trying to tap and rack to clear this weapon, clear this weapon, clear this weapon, and the guy just goes boom and grabs them. Because they were weapons dependent. They depended on that weapon. I've got to have this thing brought back into battery. I've got to be able to use it. Or I, because I've got a threat in front of me. No, you have a threat in front of you. That's it. So you can be armed, but not dangerous. And I'll, and I'll explain a little bit more of that in just a second also. What do you want to be? You really want to be unarmed and dangerous. Because what's the common denominator in that statement with what I want you to be? And what Jordan Peterson said so eloquently, I want you to be dangerous. You have to be dangerous. You have to be the threat. Screw the predator. I'm the predator. I'm the predator for bad guys. If you have that kind of mentality, you are dangerous. You are the predator's greatest threat at that point. Another predator, a superior power. Oh, wait a minute. There goes Thucydides again. I am the superior power. I'm the dangerous man. I don't care if you have a gun, a club, a stick, a rock, a pipe. If you are dangerous, it then does not matter what weapon you have because you are a warrior and you're going in, into battle. And you will fight to the death if need be, unarmed, armed, or not. And think about it. People have literally stormed machine gun nests having lost their weapons. And the guys in the machine gun nest are so, their OODA loop is so highly engaged that they can't believe what they're seeing. And a guy will storm into a machine gun nest and start smashing guys with anything he can get his hands on, and boom. And that's, those are the kind of guys that get the 
Congressional Medal of Honor. And it's happened again and again and again because they were dangerous at that moment. They had lost concern for their own safety. They have one thing that they need to do is destroy that enemy that's hurting their teammates and their friends. So, I was told once by a, by a really, really dangerous man, you have far more to fear from a deadly man than a deadly weapon. I take away the weapon, guess what I still have sitting in front of me? A deadly man. A dangerous man. And until I destroy that threat, I'm still under threat. So, one of the other things that's taught in a lot of martial arts schools is gun takeaways and defang the snake, take the knife out. I got it. There's a place for that. But if I destroy that person, that knife falls on the floor. That gun falls on the floor. Okay? And when we talk about that example I just gave you of an unarmed man storming a machine gun nest, that's exactly what I'm talking about. He's not up there to grab the machine gun. He's up there to kill the, the individuals that are manning that post. Never do anything without a purpose. Never do anything that's useless. The same deadly man who told me about you have far more to fear from a deadly man than a deadly weapon also told me this. Never do anything without a purpose. Never do anything that's useless. Doesn't apply only to self-defense, if you will, or self-offense. But it also has a lot to do with life. Uh, one of the most famous wrestling coaches that ever walked the face of the earth and one of the most highly successful wrestlers that ever walked the face of the earth is a gentleman named Dan Gable. And he had a saying that was, if something's useful, do it every day. If it's not useful, don't do it at all. But why did I bring that up? Because a lot of training time and a lot of time that we take in our training and preparing to confront evil and bad guys is things that are not effective. You really need to figure out what is going to happen. You need to figure out, it'd be like me going in and saying, you know what, I know my kicks have degraded, but I'm going to practice my kicks every single day. Well, I like kicking and I'll try and get myself back to a some semblance of use, but the point is I'm starting to do some things that might be more useless than useful. So why am I going to spend, in a three-hour training session, why am I going to spend an hour and a half working on my legs? I've got to work on some other things for that hour and a half because those are the things that I'm going to use with a purpose. Courage and cowardice, okay? Now, as we know, there are, in the words of uh, description of Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman, who is one of the most highly sought after tactical instructors that exist on the planet, there are the sheep, the sheepdogs, and the wolves. Throughout history, there have been people who run towards danger and those who retreat from danger. And it is not an act of cowardice versus courage. It's part of the DNA that we're born with, and you're either one of those sheep, and I don't use that in the term that people use it in a degrading way about sheep bull and all that kind of BS. I'm talking about the flock needs to be protected. The ones that are going to run towards danger, those are the sheep dogs. And who are they protecting us, that flock from? The wolves. Those are the bad guys. So it isn't an act of coward or courage. It's just the way it breaks down. Some people are hardwired to, to rock and roll, and some people are not. It's not good, it's not bad, it just is. But my definition of courage and cowardice is really simply this. A brave man knows he must and will do the right thing, the right thing, no matter what the cost is, even unto the point of sacrificing myself. That grenade rolls in here, I don't have a choice. 
There's only one thing I can do. Cowardice. Coward knows he must do the right thing, yet chooses to do the wrong thing just to avoid paying the price. That's a coward. Because that's a choice. The other one, the sheep and the sheepdogs, that's not a choice. That's part of that survival mechanism that kicks in. These are choices. That's the way I define courage and cowardice. Be strong, be smart, be prepared. But most of all, be dangerous. And like Jordan Peterson said, that doesn't mean going out and causing chaos and mayhem. That means we keep the sword in the sheath until we need to use it. But I've got the sword because I am a dangerous man. That's the attitude that you need to keep. Because I'm telling you right now, you wouldn't be here unless you are the sheepdogs. You wouldn't be here. It wouldn't be of any interest to you to be here to listen to what I say unless you are one of those protectors, one of those warriors, one of the ones that runs towards danger. Knowledge destroys fear. That concludes what I have to say today. Thank you all for come, coming over here. It's a wonderful show. I know you've taken your time. It's a valuable time for all of us to uh, not be at the show, to come and listen to what I had to say. I hope it's of some benefit to you. If it sounds like I'm selling the book, I'll say it again because I'm a little embarrassed at times because it sounds like an advertisement. But it will be out in the next 30 to 60 days, and it, it has chapters devoted to all of those. It's 500 plus pages long. It's the biggest book I've ever written. Uh, but it covers everything that I've talked about in here times 10 and a whole bunch of other stuff, legal advice and a whole bunch of other things. So thank you all for coming. I truly appreciate it. I hope it, I hope it was worthwhile. Thank you.